Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. Carrie, I'm so stoked to have you on the podcast, but before we get started, let's just ground with a few breaths. So if you're listening and you're driving, you can breathe with us. Please just don't close your eyes. So no matter what you're doing, I invite you to breathe with us. And if you are in a place where you can just sit down for a moment and close your eyes, just starting to get settled, feeling the feet on the floor, arriving in this time and space, And beginning to deepen the breath through the nose, inhaling all the way up. And through the mouth, exhale. Through the nose, big inhale all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Holding the breath, rolling back the eyes. Just feeling... And through the mouth, exhale. One last one. Big inhale all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Hold. And exhale. breath return to its natural state and rhythm flickering the eyes open and we are here carrie i'm so stoked to unpack all of this with you we we have so much to cover carrie and i met through what's called the impact 11 it's a speakers boot camp and community helping keynote speakers and when i went there i was i was super green rookie uh no experience at all and carrie's a little bit more of a vet in this field carrie you have quite the background i was looking at before and then i just refreshed before we uh hit record on this and just scouring through your linkedin can you just tell us some of your career highlights not to like humble brag or say anything like this but just to give a people an idea of like all the different successes and where you spend your time as it relates to business because we're going to get into some woo esoteric for some people and i just want to really Plant the seed here of like how established you are in the business world. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I've been running my company Stone Age for almost 18 years. Uh, I started, uh, took over for the founders when I was 28 years old. I had no idea what I was doing. I was very green. Uh, 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 So I I understand that feeling very well. And I uh, started out as general manager and became CEO in three years. Uh, That was started in 2007. So I was named CEO right after the 0809 financial crisis, uh, which we got through incredibly well uh, by just really focusing on our core. And, uh, and we have amazing employees. And we've taken the company from 8 million when I started to almost 100 million in revenue now. And we make industrial cleaning equipment. So we are like in the like, 
you know, the heart of industrial manufacturing. So our tools are used in every kind of heavy industrial manufacturing facility, like refineries, chemical plants, food processing plants, pharmaceutical plants, anywhere you would use ultra high pressure water to clean. Uh, we keep the supply chain running and, um, and how we've grown so much is that we've We've uh, transitioned the company from making tools that screw on the end of a hose, uh, really ultra high pressure nozzles. Think your power washer at home that you use to clean your deck, yeah, times like 10,000 <laughs> or 20,000 or 40,000. Uh, and we've been transitioning the company making now industrial cleaning robotics uh, so that humans don't have to go into these really, really dirty, dangerous, hot uh, uh, applications uh, in plants and and clean next to uh, whatever is being cleaned. They, you're you're removed from the surface and and uh, and using robotics. So it's really transformed the company. Uh, so I've had the privilege of doing this and and leading this transformation over over the last couple of decades, almost a couple of decades here. The really cool thing about Stone Age is that we're employee owned. So the founder started selling stock to employees long before I came on board, uh, but it was just a homegrown skin in the game program where employees could invest. And uh, in 2013, I started talking to them about what their exit strategy really was. And I led us through uh, what's called um, to become what's called an ESOP, which is an employee stock ownership program. Uh, and it's a way for founders to be able to, or any 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 really leadership uh, or owner, uh, be able to exit the company or or sell share to employees. So now we're 100% ESOP owned. Uh, the founders are completely out of the company, and uh, I get to run this really cool employee owned company where my employees they just they think and act like owners, and we have a remarkable culture, and we are solving really really tough industrial challenges, making sure that we all get to consume, you know, the the metal in our Stanleys or the plastic in our mouth or the aluminum in our in our cans or the glass in our phone like all that comes from facilities that we keep clean so that's a little bit about what we what we do and and what my journey has been like over the years yeah thank you for sharing that with us i mean to take that over at were you 28 28 or 28 that's incredible yeah. uh, what did if you could rewind the clock, like that was an eight million dollar company. How many employees, give or take, would you say the company had back then? Thirty. I was employee number thirty three, so I was thirty uh, third. <laughs> so at the time, was there still about thirty employees when you took? Yeah, over? well, that was actually my employee number sixty one. But um, but there were thirty two people working in the company when I came on board. So I was uh, was employee thirty the the thirty third person at that time, and uh, and so yeah, we were really really small. <laughs> So what was it that, I mean, small, all relative, you know, right. like that, that is a, a 28 years old still is young to take on a position like that. And, you know, I think there's been a lot in recent years, which is a very subjective term of like equality, not just women's rights. But back then, I think it was around 2007, 2000 mm -hmm. or 2009, you said said when you took over i mean that was probably like a big wave of like starting to actually see women in the workplace so where i'm going with this too is like you being a woman in a very stale blue collar kind male of male dominated male dominated <laughs> type company like what would you say that they really saw in you back then yeah, so I would say that over the all the industry is very much that way. I think our founders are very progressive and and always supported women. I mean, even even back, I mean, back then, uh, they had women in leadership positions in the company uh, on the executive management team. They just called it the management team back then. Uh, so so John and, and I mean, they're selling stock to employees. Like these guys were were very ahead of their time. They're very progressive. So I think they they really liked that I was not a traditional candidate, right? A, a white male in his fifties with lots of manufacturing experience. Um, you know, I actually went to I went to Colorado School of Mines, which is where they met. So uh, they, you know, I think they thought, well, if she can get through through a tough engineering school like that, like she's obviously got some grit. And uh, I'd done a lot of the the things that the general manager. I uh, was overseen, even though I had never run a company before, much less managed a person. Uh, and so I think that they just wanted something that was different. And so they decided to, to try it. And they gave me a 50-50 shot of working out. Uh, but they said, you know, we can always go back to uh, a more traditional candidate if she doesn't work. And 
you know, I didn't know anything then about founder transitions and how often they are unsuccessful when, you know, professional management, although I don't think you can necessarily call me that, uh, but when they, 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 they bring in somebody else to take over the company. Um, one of our founders has Asperger's, so he's on the spectrum. Um, and the other one is a brilliant finance, finance, uh, guy. They're both very amiable. They, they don't like to deal with, uh, with, with conflict. And so, issues were swept under the rug. And I think my personality, which is one very collaborative, very curious, very much about working together. And I know how to work with really difficult people. I can't imagine anybody else being successful and coming into that role like I was, but neither of none of us knew that at the time. So yeah. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful for them. Um, it changed my life. I had substance abuse issues and I accidentally overdosed on Labor Day of 2006, which is why I moved to Durango. I came back home. Um, and so it saved my life, the, the, the risk that they took on me. Um, it really allowed me to pour my intensity because I'm an incredibly intense human being into, into learning how to run a company. And I don't know that I would be here if it weren't for them. In terms of uh, the substance abuse, uh, would you say that it because part of that was you didn't have a strong purpose? Definitely. It's a huge yeah. part of it. I didn't feel like I belonged. I was trying to be somebody I wasn't. Uh, and that com combined with being incredibly ambitious, driven human being, um, you know, lots of, of, of people with my personality style, my drive do develop substance abuse issues because everybody does it things so intensely. I didn't know that at the time, but that combined with, yeah, feeling, um, feeling like I didn't have a purpose and feeling like I was unworthy. It was a very toxic combination. And, and you and I are just getting to know each other now, but you have a deep connection to spirituality and it seems like your higher self, like how has that played a role in your life, especially around that time with substance mm -hmm. abuse and the transition to becoming a CEO of this company? Yeah. So, um, you know, spirituality has always been woven through my life, even though I didn't know it, uh, as I was telling you in, in, before we, we started recording, my mom, uh, calls herself a recovering Catholic. And so she kept us, you know, really away from, from any kind of religion and didn't talk about spirituality, but I always felt like I was connected to, to, you know, I've always felt I was part of something that was bigger, that there, there was this deeper connection that there was, had to be purpose and meaning in what we are here to do, not just live, consume, and then die. Uh, and so, but I didn't have any framework to be able to explore because my mom was so turned off by Catholicism that she's the pendulum swung the other way. But as I matured and I started to explore my own spirituality, um, I really did develop this, this, this deep sense of connection to others, <laughs> to my higher self, to finding, you know, the, what is my purpose here? What is, what are, what does this all really mean? And, um, and that's really just matured and enriched as I've gotten older during my substance abuse issues. Um, you know, I would say that I was really up and down with spirituality. I mean, part of using substances is, is to, you know, to, to alter your state, to, uh, you, know, you, you know, right. I mean, we talk mm -hmm. about psychedelics all the time. Um, it is to expand your, your perceptions and consciousness and, 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 and open up different realms. Um, and so while that wasn't the purpose for me using drugs, um, I certainly had those experiences and I always liked that. I always liked kind of pushing those boundaries and seeing where it would go. But I would say during that time, I was not in touch with my higher self and with my purpose. Um, I was actually in a really bad space mentally, I had really poor mental health. Um, so it was, uh, you know, it was always kind of this interesting boundary pushing, but I wasn't dealing with, with my baggage and, and my personality and, and all of these things where I was just feeling like my life wasn't filled with purpose and meaning. And, and I was coping by using substances instead. Now that you're on the other side of that, not just the substance abuse, but like in, in this high power role in business as well, and, and making such a powerful influence in the business demographic with your keynotes, your book, the ownership mindset, and yeah. teaching leaders how, uh, how to be more conscious and compassionate, essentially, what would you say to someone that's just kind of stuck. Maybe it's with uh, substance abuse, but it's just kind of a stale and and stagnant lifestyle. 
Yeah, you have to know yourself. Everything comes back to I, and I don't mean that in a selfish way. Um, I mean it in truly an expansive way. If you want to be able to find your purpose, to make an impact, to change your life, you have to start with what you're doing, how you're showing up, you know, what's causing you being stuck or, or using substances to numb, to cope, um, you know, whatever that is. Uh, and it could be, you know, food, it can be gambling. There can be all different kinds of things that, that we use to not really explore ourselves. So that's, that's where I started. Um, I had no idea why I was making the decisions that I was making. And I remember lamenting that after my, my accidental overdose. And I was talking to a friend and I was like, I just don't understand. Like, I have, I have, I I'm smart. <laughs> I, I'm successful. Like I can, I, I, I function so well, but why do I make these stupid decisions? And so he said, you know, why don't you try personality assessments? They're free, um, you know, online, like start to figure out who you are. And that's where I actually got started was I took a Myers-Briggs assessment online and I was like, oh my God, I, this is me. Like, and I began that kind of curiosity of figuring things out. And then I started working with a coach and Enneagram and, and really going down this path of self-exploration, because if you don't understand yourself and then it's really hard to say, here's, here are the changes that I need to make or the modifications or how I explore this different side of me. It's interesting, Myers-Briggs and Enneagram and Gene Keys and astrology and human design. And uh, there's a few more that I'm blanking on. Like, it's just, there's so many different paths and yeah. you probably run in this, run into this too. But anytime you speak with someone that's uh, like really got figured out in one of those, it's almost like they preach like, oh, everything is Enneagram or everything is human design or the gene keys. And what I see in all of it, I've never really done my own like super, super deep dive. I've gone pr relatively deep with human design, I would say, in some of these. Obviously, I know my Myers-Briggs and Enneagram and all that, but um, most of them are pretty much saying the same thing yeah. in a different kind of way, you know? So it's, okay. it's kind of like choose your poison. Which one is going to resonate with you? It seems like. I think that's the key. It's what resonates with you the most. And to recognize that it's just a tool to help you understand yourself. That's it. And, and you can, you know, read the assessment and go, okay, that's me, but that that's not where the work is, right? Yeah. The work is then, is then diving in. And, and so what those assessments do is that they just give you language to be able to understand, stand yourself. And then, you know, when you build upon understanding that, then, okay, here are some tools that you can do to, 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 to deep dive into it. So I'm a three on the Enneagram. Enneagram resonates the most with me. Um, and I like it because the Enneagram has levels of health. And so the goal isn't to change yourself, right? It's to just how do you get into a higher level of health? Um, when you're in the highest level of health, it doesn't matter what style you are. The very best parts of you are shining through because you understand what your triggers are and what happens when you go into stress and, and what happens when you fall to a level of health. So that really resonated with me. Um, but what it did is it just gave me, and then I worked with a coach who it gave me tools then to be able to recognize when, um, my achiever, I'm a three, I'm achiever when that was becoming toxic, right? Mm -hmm. Achievers can be narcissists. If it's in a really low level of health, um, they can, you know, absolutely let their ego take over, um, to make sure that they're getting the recognition that their personality needs. And, um, and I could see that playing out through all of the bad decisions that I made in my life. And it had, it took me a while to get comfortable with this idea that I needed recognition <laughs> and mm -hmm. to be able to admit it and not feel embarrassed by it. But having those tools to understand myself and to be able to be okay with the, the, the dark side of, mm -hmm. of myself, um, it allowed just me to, for more and more for my light to be able to shine. And so that's why I like them. But I think anybody who gets hung up to say this is the only one or, you know, or, you know, feel like it puts you in a box. No, it's just simply a tool to help you understand yourself more. So pick something that resonates with you and then dive into it from an understanding, not from a, you know, the ass assessments, the end all be all. A hundred percent. Yeah, I love that. So to peek behind the curtain a little bit as the CEO of a hundred million dollar company and how many employees do you guys currently have? Uh, a little over 200. A little over 200. What does it look like inside your company to support wellness and mental health? 
Yeah. So we do a lot. Um, we, so first and foremost, we have a, a, a coach who's on staff, um, uh, and we have a whole coaching program that she and I designed, um, over the years. She's the first coach that I worked with on the Enneagram. Um, and it's actually, she's actually a life coach, um, not an executive coach or a business coach, because most of us, when we struggle, it's because we are, um, under stress and we fall into a low level of health. And then that affects us, our effect negatively affects our relationships and um, it diminishes the, our ability to do high quality work and feel connected at the workplace. So we built out this coaching program. Um, we put uh, 10 to 12 people through it a year. We have cohorts, we have classes around it. Um, and so, you know, having our own coaching program that does this deep dive is an unbelievable benefit. And I have seen amazing things where people have absolutely transformed by being able to understand their stressors and how to um to handle them in 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 the workplace um we have a, a very well used um, employee assistance program we do a lot of talking about mental health and financial health those two are often combined uh and so employees can have uh free counseling sessions or free financial uh uh fr financial or mental health or you know they they can put their children through it um, and it's actually really well used uh, because we have broken down the stigma. I think me openly sharing my mental health issues and my substance abuse issues has destigmatized it within the organization. So people aren't afraid to um, to uh, admit I need some help. We have an employee gym that's open 24 uh, seven. We, uh, we have a wellness program where we compensate people for exercising, eating healthy. We pay people to quit smoking, although we have very few smokers um, who work for us. Uh, and then we just create a really great culture. Um, we want people to feel like they belong. And that really matters. I mean, just that simple thing alone where people feel like I belong on this team, I belong in this company, it eases so much stress because you're not trying to pretend you're somebody who you aren't um, to be successful in your role. So those are just some of the things that we do. Yeah, thank you for highlighting those. And uh, belonging, What what does that look like to create a culture of belonging? That you can be yourself. Yeah. I mean, that's simply what it is, right? That you can be yourself. And I think that because um, because one of our founders has Asperger's, uh, we've always been that kind of company. Not to say that he's always made it easier or people have had it easy working with him, uh, but we love quirkiness and we want people to feel like they can be their authentic selves. Now, we do talk about authentic, uh, accountability with authenticity, or you just can't be your authentic self and spew your emotional baggage on people. Mm -hmm. um, you have to always remember that the person on the other side of your authenticity has to be able to receive that. And so how do you own your own emotional responses and the way you're showing up authentically to understand that we are all in this together. And so, um, so that's what we really try to do is we try to, you know, let everybody have a voice. We tell people we love quirkiness, like be quirky, be yourself, share your ideas. Uh, and then I think with our, our feedback system and our coaching program that people who might be a little bit rough around the edges, um, in their communication style, you know, we help them, we help them figure out how to be able to show up authentic, authentically, but be effective and influential in the workplace. So to me, it's belonging is simply like, I, I feel like I belong here. I feel like I can be myself here, that I'm welcome here and that my contributions matter. And that's what we work really hard to, to teach our managers how to bring that out, um, within their teams. Yeah. What, what I'm hearing is like to use more of like spiritual jargon, like energetic hygiene, you yeah. know, and I think this uh, gets missed so often in not only spiritual conscious circles, but also like wellness circles as well, when you're trying to create a culture of belonging, but like projecting and fix it mentality and like, Hey, what does it actually mean to hold space for someone else? Because yeah. most of the time we are just like, just focused on fix it. Right. And, yeah. and what that is in my, my understanding and my belief of it is, Oh, I'm getting triggered by what someone else is saying. And I want to fix that in them because I subconsciously know I have that same thing. So I'm yeah. going to focus on them to bypass my own work, yeah. you know? Yep, yeah, absolutely. I agree. It's either fix it 
and, and certainly judgment. Um, and we call it walking beside somebody. So, uh, and so I think that's a really good way for people to understand like what that means. So if somebody is having a rough time, um, or, you know, or isn't showing up in a way that is showing up in a way that's triggering you, how do you remove yourself from that triggering moment and just walk beside that person? And mm. then it, it puts you in, in, into a space of empathy, right? Um, okay. I'm going to walk beside this person. I'm going to imagine what it's like to be in their shoes and to, um, um, to just understand that, to try to understand what they're going through rather than paint my judgment or my expectations or how I want them to be different onto them. So I think it's like different when you're right there in front of each other and going back and forth, that's different than like, let's just sit next to each other. In fact, actually, let's just go for a walk <laughs> because mm -hmm. when you move, it's really, it really does help be able to make that dialogue safer. So that's what we, how we talk about it is, is I'm just going to walk beside you right now. Instead of trying to change the situation or change what you're saying or change what you're doing, I'm just going to walk beside, beside you. And I think that helps people put the whole holding space into like, into context of like, what does that actually mean? And how can I do that right now in the moment? Yeah, that's great. Great way to in, in, integrate it as well. So with spirituality and business, like you probably have some beliefs and practices that you do outside of the business, but what are some things you can speak to in terms of how spirituality plays a role in our professions? Yeah. I mean, so I think one connecting, you know, mind, mind and body, like what you just did in to, 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 to kick off the podcast with breathing. I mean, I lead all my meetings that way. And a lot of my other managers do as well. We don't require it, but I think taking three deep breaths, right. Mm -hmm. It is amazing how it can put you back into your body. Um, and so that's something that, uh, that we bring in and it's really that mind body connection. I mean, our bodies tell us so much every single day, if we just pause to listen to <laughs> what our bodies are telling us. And I think that's a really easy, uh, it's a much easier thing for people who might not be like, Oh, kind of that woo woo stuff. I'm not going to do that. Like, Hey, it's just be in your body, right? Feel your feet on the floor. That is such an easy way to ground yourself. Just mm -hmm. you're feeling stressed. Literally just imagine your feet on the floor right now. And you instantly can feel yourself, you know, drop down um, a, a level of intensity. So teaching, teaching, um, you know, people, some of those simple mindfulness uh, tricks that can help them, you know, reduce stress um, in the moment is something that we really do. Um, our whole coaching program, uh, you know, is built around the Enneagram and the Enneagram is a very spiritual, has a lot of spirituality in it. And so um, we, everybody who goes through that program gets a flavor of that. And it's really about connecting into your intuition. What is your body telling you? What is your heart telling you? What is your gut telling you? Um, what is your mind telling you? And how do you how do you integrate and incorporate all of those different things? So this it's absolutely woven into um, into our coaching program. And then I talk about it. I tell people I'm a spiritual person. I say I use my intuition. Um, I know I do. I have conversations with my higher self to really make sure that I'm aligned with, you know, with with my body, my personality, and my soul. And um, and I'm and I talk about it openly, not to make anybody feel like that's what they need to do. But hey, this is how I make decisions, and this is how I show up as a leader. And I think people appreciate it because they know I'm a different kind of leader and, and, uh, and it makes it safer to be able to talk about what those spiritual journeys are. You know, I think most people have some level of spirituality in them, whether they're, you know, religious or not. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and I think people feel appreciative that they can be themselves in that moment because I model being myself as a leader, being vulnerable and, and, and sharing my experiences and, and talking about my own spiritual journey. It's it's funny because I, I I wasn't planning on bringing this up, and I feel like I brought this up on a recent pod, anyways. But I recently spoke to it was just a pro bono thing for some managers uh, in project management in different industries, and there was only like ten of them there, and it was about the new book Overcome the Overwhelm. The speech is Overcoming Overwhelm and Six Step Breath Process to Access Inner Peace. Now that is a lot of jargon right there, but I would say those 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 words have to do with feelings. When yeah. when you agree, yes, <laughs> you know, 100%, like yes. <laughs> overcome. That's got energetic charge of uh, of uh, of of feelings, uh, overwhelm, and overcoming breath, inner peace, all of it. So this woman at the end of the presentation, she goes and she said like this: "You talked a lot about feelings, but the thing is, 
feelings don't have an IQ. What would you say to that? Oh, my gosh. Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah, right. Wow. What did you say? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, first, I had to do some deep breaths myself and and center myself and, and notice my own triggers coming up and the heat within my body. And I don't remember exactly what I said, but I, I went back to... Um, I actually don't remember. What I do remember is I, I had something that was more, you know, like uh, you're talking about channeling. Uh, Will Ferrell in old school where he kind of like blacks out and then like he channels that message in the debate at the end. Yeah. And yeah. then he's like, what just happened? Yes. <laughs> right. You yeah. know, like it was kind of more like that, something just coming through. And I don't remember at this point. I just remember how it made me feel. Yeah. And I remember catching up with a buddy that lives in that town. And he goes, and this is a guy that's not spiritual at all. He's like, what? He goes, has she ever heard of emotional intelligence? And I remember that more than anything. But like, oh, man, that's so good. I that was the best that. answer right there. <laughs> yeah, that's so perfect right there. But, you know, these um, it's interesting because I, I do 100 percent believe because you guys have this have had this culture for such a long time and you're leading by example. It's easier for people to get on board, but maybe taking a step away from you as CEO of Stone Age, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I keep wanting to say Stonehenge for yeah, obvious reasons. Yes, right? yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you probably get that a lot. Stone All the time. <laughs> yeah, but being a speaker and working with people in their organizations, what sorts of resistance are you seeing come up for other organizations? You know, honestly, not that much because I think part of my gift with speaking and using words. And I think this is part of my larger purpose um, with, you know, with what I'm doing now and what comes next after Stone Age, which is not for a long time, but there will be a life after Stone Age, um, is that I have a really, I think, a, a, a ability to be able to um, to be pragmatic about it, right? I have all of this experience and I have had tremendous success and, and, and then I just talk about it in really real terms. I don't use words that, um, you know, like, okay, holding space versus just walk beside this person. Right? I, I've, I've learned how to be able to, to put, to use words that it doesn't matter if you're spiritual or not, or not that you can see yourself in, in it. And so I think because of, you know, the combination of, of, of how I tell a story, my experiences and successes, and then this just really real way I have of talking to people where I meet them or at the level that they're at, um, it really resonates with people. And I found tremendous, tremendous success in, in, in my keynotes because of that. I just keep it real. I'm just a real person. I use simple language that everybody can understand and resonate with. And I share my experience and my story. And I invite people to see themselves in that story and, and then take out of it what resonates with them. And so I think that that's why I've been able to, 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 to really be successful and not have like this kind of pushback. I had a guy walk up to me um, after I gave a speech. I was at, doing it for the American... Um, uh, uh, fuel and petroleum manufacturer. So every big oil and gas company. And I gave a speech on how to create the ownership mindset within your organization. And he walked up to me afterwards and he was like, oh God, at first I thought this is going to be so woo woo. Like you got pretty soft there, but as you went through and it wasn't at all, you know, it was not soft, but okay. You know, that was his perspective. Um, but man, the points that you made, they were spot on. And I walked away, like, I'm going to do these three things tomorrow to, to start working with my team on this. And so I appreciate that, that, you know, some good old boy, uh, down in, you know, Houston, Texas, uh, could sit there in my speech and maybe be a little bit turned off by my talk of, you know, a people centric culture, uh, and walk away with just really actionable, I, uh, actionable things to do. And, you know, my spirituality and my viewpoint on life is woven through every single one of those takeaways. Mm -hmm. What, what was, uh, do you remember what might've been, or what is something that you talk about that is a little bit more on the spiritual side or woo side for someone like that to be like, Oh yeah. I don't know. Like how deep would you go? Yeah. So, um, so like talking about like, uh, receiving feedback, for example, yeah. and, and I talk about really being able to know yourself when you are 
are experiencing getting feedback from somebody where we all need feedback to be able to grow. And most of us don't handle it really well. We want to get defensive. We want to go into protect and defend mode. And, and so how do you stay out of protect and defend mode, especially as a leader in that moment where you can do some real damage. And so I talk about understanding yourself, knowing yourself, you know, feeling confident in your strengths and your weaknesses and, and having the humility because you know yourself, because you have done this exploration um, to be able to say, I can handle this feedback. And it's really tough to be able to handle feedback well if you don't know yourself. And that's when you go into protect and defend mode rather than, you know, be really open to going like, okay, I need to understand how I'm showing up here. Um, What feels true to me? What feels untrue to me? And how do I own this? How do I really own this for, you know, who I am as a, a person and as, you know, my, my purpose here on this planet. And so I talk about it like that for, in, in something that's really concrete around, around how do you, how do you take feedback like a champ? Um, Well, you got to know yourself and you got to be able to, to have that humility to really be able to explore it. And, and, and that's what spirituality is really about. And I think that that's why people get, maybe get turned off by it is because, you know, there is this whole different language that's used around it, but what it is, it's really about knowing yourself and understanding that you are not your personality. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And that's a hard concept for people to understand. Um, but that's where the work is and, and everything that we're doing every single day is, is, is based on energy, consciousness, Mm -hmm. connectedness. And, and, you know, we live this very individual experience because of our personalities, right? That's how we're here to learn and to grow and to experience things, to expand consciousness, but we just get too stuck in that personality. And, and spirituality is really about exploring so that you understand yourself at a deeper level and you can start to separate your true self from what your personality is. And, uh, and so we're doing that work every day, whether we're consciously doing it or not. Yeah. You know, I, I think of personal development and how that leads so directly to soul development or spiritual development. And I know for me, I remember a friend back in the day, probably like early college was like, all your interest in like book topics, they're all self help. And I'm like, huh, I never, I never realized that. But that was like the first reflection where I really realized that I was really big into personal development. And that's for sure what led me to soul development and spiritual development and now what we're seeing since the lockdowns is a lot of people from the personal development start to get into biohacking things uh, such as like cold baths right and these different what you think are like personal development right and then it just starts like that line starts to get blurred and then it goes deeper and deeper and then you get into soul development and what's cool is like people that weren't into personal development are now getting into personal development. And then it's the same thing's going to happen. So very similar to what you said before we hit record about like our, our financial system, our government, and all of this collapsing and being rebuilt. I was actually really stoked during the pandemic uh, with respect to the devastation being caused. Cause I was like, let's, let's burn it all down. The Phoenix let's re let's build a new and it was um actually quite uh devastating and I, I don't use that word lightly i use that word intentionally in 2022 when i started to realize oh wow we're going back to the way things were and, but we're um, not but we're but not no, 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 right hear me out though like yeah. it, it, a lot of people that were starting to wake up yeah. like it's the momentum we're definitely there is no going back to where we were yeah. but the momentum the momentum was shot and now it's like okay if we're going to go through like, like if i'm going through a personal dark night of the soul I'm like, I'm going to surrender. I'm going to lean into this because I know the more I resist, the harder it's going to get. And that's kind of where we're at as a collective. I'm seeing at least it feels like there's a lot of resistance and going backwards and it's not going all the way back, but there is resistance. So I'd love to hear what comes up for you. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, I think we humans, we expect things to happen fast, um, but it's not right. This is just a process. And, you know, we're, you know, the billion, the plan is billions and billions of years old. And there are people who believe that, you know, that there have been souls that have been here for billions and billions of years. And so when you take a step back and you look at what's happening in a moment of time, it can feel like it's going really slow or, you know, like, oh, there was this movement to do some real change. And now we're moving backwards. And, and to me, it's all just, just this process that that we're going for, going through and that things will break down they always always do whether it's going to happen in your and my life in our life in our lifetime where we actually see what that rebuilding looks like who knows but it's going to happen and so i think that we can get frustrated with progress because you can see oh like these things are happening and i'm not in agreement with it but I think it's all part of what's supposed to happen and what's going to happen. And it's out of our control. And what we have to do is just say, okay, I'm not going to live in fear from this because fear pulls me into this broken system rather than go, okay, I'm going to be part of bringing positivity and in compassion and empathy and joy um, into the world, because that's what's going to, you know, it's what's going to eventually have to come back. We're going to come back to. So that's how I look at it is, is, is that we're in, like, we're in this wormhole. Hmm. We're in the wormhole and we're probably in the middle of the wormhole. And it's really, I think, um, you know, I think we want to say, oh, we have to be almost through this, right? The pandemic was over a couple of years ago. And so we got to be coming out of the wormhole. But the reality is, is that we were in the wormhole before the pandemic and we're probably still in the middle of it. And we got to work our way through some other really crappy things before we come out of that wormhole. And, and that wormhole could be decades. It could be centuries. It could be, you know, a lot longer than that. Um, but that's the process that humanity is going through right now. We're in a, we're in a wormhole. We're in a wormhole. I, I like that saying we're in a wormhole. I haven't mm -hmm. heard it put like that, but that, that resonates. I get that. But when you're in the wormhole, you don't understand it. You don't feel it. Right. You feel like mm -hmm. I'm living my life and you don't even realize that you're in the wormhole, but that's, that's what I feel. That's what really resonates with me. And that, that I think that we're, we're in this, we're in this really in, in, in the wormhole. We can't see it. We can't feel it. Well, maybe some people can, but, um, but there's not like this, like, oh, suddenly it's going to get over. Well, we're going to look at 30 years from now and really understand what COVID did, right? We're just in the very, very beginning of seeing what the pandemic and, and all of these things that are happening since, what that actually really means. Mm -hmm. we're, we're just still too close to it to actually have any, and, and we can't, we don't know how the future is going to unfold, but to really understand the, the consequences and, and how it's going to change society and humanity. Yeah. We're, we're, we're way too soon to be able to, to really fully understand that. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think of it kind of like the stages of flow and after being in a flow state, one of the most Game, cha game changing things a mentor of mine has said about flow is rather than pushing and uh, maximizing when you're in a flow state, leave that flow state when you're about 80%. So it's easier to go back yeah. into it because I was going into it at the time, like 110%. And then I would have these long crashes afterwards. And he was like, well, actually it's a recovery period. It's not a yeah. crash, but you're experiencing it as a crash because you're going 110%. Yeah. And that changed everything for me. So what we're talking about right now, like the way I look at it is like, we're in a recovery these past couple of years. Yeah. Cause the time of this recording, it'll be interesting to go back to this podcast afterwards, right? Because we're in yeah. June, but it's an election year and things are going to heat up. And I mean, that's usually when things uh, go sideways. So we'll see what happens. But moving forward, like not having a crystal ball or anything like that, talk with us a little, little bit about your aspirations to be a part of what I'm going to use the term, uh, the new earth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I none of us know how the future is going to be tenfold. Anybody who says they do, you know, we don't. Uh, uh, but yeah. uh, you know, it's all going to unfold it, as it unfolds. Um, but yeah, I have. Um, yeah, I. You know, I'm here. I'm here on this earth to use my gift of words, both spoken and written, to help expand consciousness, to help people understand that 
that that's actually what we're all here to do, right? We're here to, to, uh, to learn, to grow, to experience, and that what we attach, um, you know, good and bad to isn't actually really real, right? They're just ex- simply experiences. And, and so I think as we go continue to get through this wormhole, whether, you know, we come out of it in my lifetime or whether we're still in it and, 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 and looking at how, how we need to change to advance humanity. I feel like I'll be part of, of something, you know, on the other side of that. And so, you know, whether that's in politics, whether that's in leadership, whether that's, um, you know, in something that we haven't even imagined what that looks like yet. Yeah. I think that, that, that I'm going to be a big part of, of, of building what that new future is going to look like, because let's face it, like this is only working right now for billionaires. That's it. Mm. I mean, even though I think people are generally like, you know, you ask people like, you know, in your own life, like, are you happy? I think most people say yes, not everybody, but most people say yes. But then you're like, but look at the state of the world. It's horrible. Um, uh, <laughs> and and so, you know, I think there's like a, a disconnect uh, there between people's perception of how bad things really are and, and how things really aren't that bad in their own lives, um, which is an interesting human phenomenon. But um, but in reality, you know, it, the 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 social fabrics aren't working for for most of the people in the world, uh, unless you you know are are very very wealthy, and so that's why I love running an employee owned company where we're helping people create their own wealth, but it's not working, and so we're gonna have to figure out a different way, and it's probably gonna get uglier before it's gonna get worse before it gets better. We got to go through whatever this transition is going to look like so that we can come out and say, all right, that didn't work. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let's try something different. And that's what I want to be part of, of, okay, now we're ready to try something different and, and, and playing my role, um, and my life's purpose, my, my life's purpose, my soul's purpose and in, in what that future looks like. Yeah, I see that for you. And, you know, it, going back to the wormhole and where we're at now, in a lot of ways, it's this integration phase where yeah. it's like, okay, now we experience all this. Now there is an interest of learning these different healing, not even healing, that's not even the right word, but different modalities to connect with one another on a deeper layer yeah. and let go of our mass and all of that. And all of that is going to be so desperately need for what we are creating. Yeah, so, I agree. Yeah, this whole idea that somehow, you know, our politicians are going to save us, um, you know, and this hatred that that especially here in the United States, but it, but it's everywhere, right, where we're just becoming more and more pol- polarized. This idea that 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 is somehow actually going, you know, fighting that is somehow going to actually make things better. It's just... But I think we got to we got to go down and and break it down and and get to this point when we realize like, okay, it didn't work. But, you know, we really are in all in in this together. There's no doubt about that. I love it. Like I read Popular Mechanics and, you know, and more and more and more. They're talking about everything being connected, about things that people never imagined having consciousness does. Like there was just one that our cells have consciousness. Well, duh. Right. They do amazing things. It's not like they don't. And it's not like consciousness like humans have, but it's processing data and it's 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 making decisions and doing certain functions based on what that data is. And, and, and so, yeah, I think that, that we're going to go back and start to realize like we are really all connected. And if we're all connected, then why are we hating another person? Because in reality, when we're hating somebody else, we're hating part of ourselves and, uh, and, 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 and changing that whole view that we have in this very individualistic, um, it's all about me place that we've evolved to at this point in, in time. Yeah, I I agree with that so much. I think when we can look at whatever that feeling is, hatred, whatever it is, or dislike, disgust of someone else or judgment, if if we can just turn it back inward and be like, where is that in me? Because that's yeah. the stemming of the trigger. Not only does that heal it for the other person, but heals it for you because exactly. you're healing it for you. It's not getting mirrored back to you because it really is just you listening right now. Yeah. We're just reflections of you. So 
that's the the deepness that we'll leave it at. But thank you, Carrie. This is a uh, awesome your book ownership mindset. There's a link for it in the show notes, a link to your podcast as well, which I was recently on. Thanks for having me on your podcast and just being a a, a true true heart centered leader and showing the way within your organization and for other leaders like those good old boys and everyone else that need to hear this message. So I appreciate. It. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to visit with you, Sam. Thanks, Gary.